Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. Let me turn on the, the microphone for the room. Uh, yeah, you, I guess, yeah, that sounds better. Let me bring it up higher up. OK, so I think I'll hold it like that. This sounds better. OK, so we'll be talking about uh, graphs and how to find uh, uh, patterns in large graphs. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Chris for the invitation and uh, Sanil for uh, uh, spending a lot of time yesterday. Thank you, Nicole. And also, Nicole. Lower is better? This is good? OK, good. So we stay with that. Uh, Sanil and also Nicole for doing an excellent job in answering one million emails to, for, with respect to hotels and everything else. So this is the outline of the presentation. First, we'll see what's the problem and uh, why is this interesting. Then we'll see uh, uh, laws, patterns that appear in uh, static and dynamic graphs and generators. And then we'll see some tools and some additional uh, uh, piece of work like virus propagation. So we'll f schedule the talk around the four the, the following five problems, right? Uh, how do real graphs look like? How do they evolve? And so on. So first of all, why should we worry about uh, graphs at all? And by the way, this is joint work with uh, Dipei Chakrabarty, who, uh, who now joined uh, Yahoo Research. So graphs appear in many, many settings, right? So the top shows uh, a communication, computer communication network. Every dot is an autonomous system, like Purdue.edu, CMU.edu. Every link means that these systems are connected. Uh, they, they, they can send packets to each other, right? And we have a network, and we want to figure out how this network looks like. The second graph is from biology, is a, a prey-predator graph. Every node is a species. Every line means that the, 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 the node at the bottom is being preyed upon by the node at the top. The next graph is a clear social network. Every node is a high school student, and every edge is directed edge is a who likes whom relationship. Uh, this is a graph of protein-protein interaction graph. So this every dot is a protein. Every edge means that these two proteins participate in some chemical reaction to make our, our cells work. Right? And the list continues. In information retrieval, we have uh, the standard vector space model uh, treats uh, documents. We can envision a, a collection of documents as a bipartite graph. The documents are the nodes on the left, terms are the nodes on the right. Whenever a document contains some terms, we have edges to the appropriate terms. Uh, the web itself is a huge graph. Uh, every node is a web page, every bipartite. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, well, hopefully it will go away by itself. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yes, great. Uh, thanks, Microsoft, or Symantec. Uh, and uh, uh, the web is a large graph. The list continues. Actually, every time we have a verb in the English language, I like chocolate, then we have uh, probably a bipartite graph, uh, people liking products or food items, right? So the list continues. We could have uh, companies and board of directors, or like Jennifer is working on, on uh, stock, uh, stock brokers and uh, the, the, their collaborators to spot uh, anomalies, to spot uh, illegal trading, and so on. Uh, we could have viral marketing. We know a social network who is the best person to, uh, to advertise our product to, so that a word of mouth campaign, we have the best possible results for our marketing budget. Uh, web logs, who points to whom? Everybody reads uh, Slashdot and uh, points, uh, points to that. Uh, how do ideas from Slashdot or from the most influential blogs propagate over the other blogs? Uh, computer network security, can we spot? Uh, if we're given IP traffic, who sends packets to whom? Can we spot anomalies? Can we spot uh, who is under attack? Who is a part of a zombie of a botnet and so on? So the first problem is, how does the internet look like? If we plot it carelessly, uh, we, get, uh, we get a graph which is, reveals no patterns, right? In, in social networks, this is called the death star because it looks like a mess. And most networks, if we don't plot them carefully, they look like uh, a, a mass of uh, unspecified, with no patterns, right? Uh, so we'd like to figure out how the web looks like, what is normal or, and what is abnormal. Normal, uh, what we actually mean is what is usual. Right, because nobody knows what exactly is normal, and also want to figure out what patterns and what uh, laws seem to hold. Right, so are real graphs random? We are uh, a social network here. Some people know some other people. Is this uh, is this social network random? Uh, random means pick two people at random. Do they have the same chance of having a link between them? The answer is 
No, absolutely not, right? Despite the fact that uh, random graphs are uh, celebrated, the erdos reni model with beautiful theorems, phase transition ab 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 about them, uh, in reality, we never have such graphs where all edges are equally probable, right? What happens in real graphs? We have uh, strange patterns like the diameter. We have all heard of the six degrees of separation, right? Uh, everybody's six handshakes away from everybody else in the world, more or less, right? We'll also see that there are uh, strange patterns with respect to the in and out degree distributions and some other patterns that we'll see later. So let's start with a degree distribution. Somebody uh, actually, uh, 97 people measured the autonomous system graph, uh, u.edu, cmu.edu, right? And every node was the autonomous system. Every edge was a, a link between two autonomous systems when they could send packets to each other. So they, they knew about each other, right? And they figured out that uh, the average degree is about 3.3, uh, right? So what would we say? That's a fact. We, can, we don't need to argue about it, right? Uh, uh, what we would need to discuss is, uh, what is the most common value? If you pick a node at random, right? Close your eyes, pick a node at random. Uh, what is the most probable value for the degree of this node, right? Most people will say, well, if we plot the degree here and the uh, probability density function, the number of nodes with such and such degree, well, probably this should look like a Gaussian, right? Almost everything that we've seen in textbooks is a Gaussian, right? So the most common value would either be three or four, right? We that, that's what everybody would agree on. Uh, what do you think is the most common value? Turns out it's one, right? What happens is the vast majority of people are barely connected, have degree one, or at least the vast majority of autonomous systems have degree one. There are a few with degree two, a very few with degree three, and there are a few like IBM.com, AT&T.com with degree 800, which drag the average to be around 3.3. So the, if we know the average in such a skewed distribution, it's actually useless. It gives us no information about what is happening with this distribution. So uh, that was, this is bad news actually, right? Before that, if, if things were Gaussian, we would know a lot about this distribution, right? Now, now we know nothing. So are there no patterns? It turns out that if we plot this distribution uh, the way Zipf did uh, 50 years ago, uh, then we see a stunning pattern. We see a Zipf-like distribution. So uh, this is the rank of, of every node with respect to its connectivity, and this is the, the degree. So rank one, the best connected uh, autonomous system is AT&T.com. Not surprising, it's a communication company, right? With degree 800. Uh, the next most connected is IBM.com, so rank two, uh, degree uh, about 600, and so on and so forth. If we plot it in log-log scales, we see that it follows what people are calling generalized if distribution with slope minus 0.8. So this is, this is a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, pattern, right? Uh, it turns out that there are additional more patterns. Uh, let's uh, go to the second one and leave the other three, the, the other two later. So if we take the adjacency matrix and plot, compute the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix, uh, then, and if we plot the so-called scree plot, which means the rank of every eigenvalue and then the eigenvalue itself, then we see that the very first eigenvalue is about 80. The, the second biggest eigenvalue is about 40. The next one is so on and so forth. If we plot them, they look, they fall along a line in log-log scales. So, okay, so the autonomous systems, and specifically that was all from uh, April 98, the autonomous systems uh, seem to follow power laws. Do other graphs follow similar power laws? It turns out that a lot of them follow similar skewed distribution. So if we have the overlay network from Gnutella, this is December 2000, from Jovano, Jovanovic at uh, UC, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. And then we plot the, the degree here in logarithmic scales and the count in logarithmic scales. Again, we see a very skewed distribution. A lot of people are barely connected. There is one person who has degree about 200. This person wants to become a mini Napster, uh, despite the fact that Napster was sued, was sued a year before that. Right? And again, we see a very skewed distribution. Uh, in other networks, we also see skewed distribution. So this is a citation network from sites here on uh, 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 June 2001. So the m here we have the number of citations, and here we have the count, how many people we have with so many citations. So 
Back in 2001, Jeff Fullman was first with 8,000 citations, and there was only one person with so many citations. The next was Gary, of Gary and Johnson, with uh, 6,000 citations, and so on and so forth. With, with 1,000 citations, exactly 1,000 citations, we have seven people. We can probably look them up and figure out who they are. The important thing is that they follow a power law, right? Or a skewed distribution. This is another data set. Uh, who visits what uh, website? This is from uh, Alan Montgomery at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. So this is a bipartite graph, 20,000 users who, uh, beyond my belief, they agreed to uh, let monitoring software uh, run on their computers for no compensation, just uh, volunteer that. And then there were about uh, 200,000 sites that these people visited. So now let's uh, plot, let's figure out how does the popularity of site goes, right? So the most popular, the, the data set was anonymized, so the most popular site, let's call it quote, quote, eBay, we don't know if it was eBay or Google or Yahoo, right? The most popular site had uh, 100,000 visits, and there was only one site like that. The next site was uh, whatever was left, Google or Yahoo or eBay, right? With uh, 100,000 visits and so on and so forth. And there were 100,000 websites with uh, just one visit, right? Apparently, they were very bad and people never visited again. And, uh, and, and, and there were several billion websites that people don't, didn't even visit once, right? So again, in log-log scales, it follows a very skewed, uh, very nice uh, line. Uh, opinions.com, this is a data set uh, that uh, Pedro Domingos and uh, Matt Richardson from, from uh, Washington University made public. Uh, again, this is who trusts whom in the opinions.com. It's a site where people write comments about products and also write comments about comments. So if you write something about IBM laptops and uh, I say, yes, I agree, with, uh, uh, I agree with you that this is a good product, then I, there is a link from me to you, right? So here is a person. So this is the out degree. So there is a person who has 2,000 edges like that. And the vast majority of people, they have only a single edge. So 20,000 people uh, have uh, a single edge coming out. So apparently, this person has a lot of time in his, his or her hands uh, making links, right? But again, it's in log-log scales. It's a power law. Uh, this is a famous paper from um, uh, back then, the IBM Clever Group, Ravi Kumar, Agavan, uh, Tompkins, and uh, Raza Gopalan. Uh, so this is the in degree of websites. Uh, that was the original plot. If we uh, twisted by 40, uh, rotated by 45 degrees, then this is the PDF, the standard PDF. So this is the in degree of every site, and this is the frequency, how often we see an in degree of such and such. So we see that very high in degree, there are very few websites. Uh, in degree one, there are a lot of websites within degree one. Again, uh, the plot follows nicely on, on a power law, on a line. Let's keep this one. So. Uh, how do real graphs look like? We have not answered the question completely, and probably there will never be a perfect answer. But at least we know that real graphs have skewed in-degree and out-degree distributions. Now, the second problem is, OK, these were all static graphs. We had a snapshot. We analyzed it, and we found all these results. Uh, what happens if we have successive snapshots of these graphs over time? Right? So this joint work with uh, Yuri Leskovich, who is uh, completing his PhD at uh, CMU, and John Kleinberg of uh, uh, hits of uh, Hubs and Authorities fame while he was visiting uh, CMU for his sabbatical. So uh, we have a collection of graphs, several, one graph for every snapshot, uh, for every time tick, right? for every day, let's say. Uh, how does the diameter change as the graph grows? Most graphs that we have seen so far are growing, right? So according to one assumption, if we believe it's a random, a random graph erdos range model, then, and if, uh, if we are at phase transition, then the diameter should be growing as log n, very slowly, but uh, log n. Uh, if, uh, if we believe the Barabasi model, which says preferential attachment, if I come into a group, I'll get connected to the most connected person with higher probability, then the diameter should be log log n. So what is the correct? The, the proofs are correct. The, 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 we're questioning the assumptions that they're making. So which assumption is correct? How, how does real graph go? Log n or log log n? How do they grow? It turns out that they shrink, actually. The diameter shrinks over time. We, we were extremely surprised ourselves. So here are the data. Uh, this is uh, citations among physics papers from uh, ARCSIV, right? Uh, over, over 10 years, 92 to 2003. So uh, the diameter started being 9 and then dropped around 6 and kept on dropping, either drops or stabilizes, probably stabilizes. Right? 
So, so that was one data set, and these are def different definitions of the diameter, just making sure that we didn't have any, any error there, uh, and different w measurements. This is another data set. This is the autonomous system we mentioned before. Uh, we started at uh, uh, 90, 1997 with 3,000 nodes. The, we have several snapshots, one every day. Uh, uh, eventually, we had uh, 6.5 thousand nodes. Again, the diameter uh, decreases with the size of the graph, and uh, which is also decreased with time. There's a very small decre decrease from 4.8 to 4.6, uh, and the definition of diameter is such that it has uh, fractional values. We interpolate between the appropriate values. Uh, but the bottom line is that it decreases. Another data set is collaborations between uh, uh, physics authors. So this is uh, uh, another graph of uh, who wrote what paper. And again, we see that the diameter decreases over time. This is the largest data set we had. Patent citations freely available on the web. Uh, started from 75 until 2000. Uh, at the final point, there were three, three, millions, uh, three million uh, patents and uh, about 13 million uh, edges among them. Again, the diameter drops, right? So, so that was an observation that we didn't expect, right? We would expect the diameter to grow. The other observation is how, what is the connection between nodes and edges, number of nodes and number of edges. So suppose that the last year we had so many nodes, one million nodes, and this year the number of nodes doubled in, in the graph of interest, right? Autonomous system or patents or whatever we're measuring, right? Uh, what do we expect the number of edges, uh, how do we expect the number of edges to behave? Most people will say, well, probably doubled, right? Since the number of nodes doubled, the number of edges doubled. It turns out that it over doubles, but it over doubles with a nice pattern. And actually, this pattern is most obvious if we plot the number of nodes versus the number of edges in logarithmic scales. So this is another power law. And this is probably one of the few power laws with positive slope. Everything else is tilting downward, right? So, so can, can you guess what is the slope? It doesn't. The slope actually turns out to be 1.6, 1.7. And we didn't expect, and I don't think anybody expected this slope. But at least it's in the right ranges, right? So if, if our graph was a tree, so this is the citation among papers, right? Who cited whom? Uh, if it was a tree, then the slope would be one. The number of nodes would be roughly the number of edges minus one, so the slope would be one, right? Uh, if it was a clique, everybody cites everybody else in the past, then we would have quadratic number of edges, so the slope would be two. So our graph, our sequence of graphs, behaves something between a full clique and a, a very sparse tree, and probably tilts more like a, a full clique, but it's not exactly a full clique. And the same observation is true for the other data sets. So this is physics papers. This is uh, the patent. That was the biggest data set that we mentioned, right? The slope is extremely close to 1.7, uh, almost a full click. This is the autonomous systems, very sparse, 1.2, but not, not close to it, a little bit denser than a tree. Uh, this was the bipartite graph of authors and their publications, again, sparse. 1.15. Uh, so, so this is these are some observations about temporal evolution of graphs, right? The, the diameter seems to be shrinking or stabilizing, and the number of edges and the number of uh, nodes follow this densification power law with exponent 1.6 or 1.2, uh, at least for the data set we have seen so far. Right? Now the question is, how can we generate how can we generate realistic graphs like that? So here is the problem. Uh, we would like to have a program which will generate a sequence of graphs with uh, n1 nodes and 2 and 3, a growing sequence of nodes, so that these graphs look realistic. And of course, realistic is uh, very hard to define. What would be a realistic graph? We don't know and probably will never be able to tell completely. But at least we have seen that real graphs obey the following patterns. Power law in degrees, small diameters, right, six degrees of separation, power law for eigenvalues, we saw the shrinking diameters, and we saw the growth power law. So let's, let's at least insist on these five patterns, right? So how would, we, how would we generate a growing sequence of graphs which will obey these patterns? These are static patterns, and these is patterns as the graphs grow. So the, the main idea, the high-level uh, bit, is that 
we will rely on self-similarity uh, because it's a convolved argument, because self-similarity leads to power laws. So if our graphs are created in a self-similar way, we expect to have all the power laws coming out for free without us having to worry about degree sequences and things like that. And also, real graphs probably have communities within communities, right? We are a computer science community. Within this, there is the database community. Within this, there are the query optimizing community, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, self-similarity uh, is closely related to fractals. So this is a famous, uh, the Sierpinski triangle is a famous fractal, right? Uh, we start with a triangle. We pull out the middle. We pull out the middles of the middles, and eventually we have a strange data set, which is not one-dimensional, which is not two-dimensional, it's somewhere in between, right? And uh, uh, maybe some of you have seen the Hilbert curve, which uh, twists and turns around, and it's very useful for spatial database like Walid was, we were working with Walid a long time ago. Uh, so uh, fractals are eventually useful. Let's see how this self-similarity idea can help us generate realistic graphs, right? So let's start from from uh, a small graph, which is like a chain. And then, of course, we can use any starting graph we want. right? So the idea behind self-similarity is that uh, at the second iteration, we will replace every node. Every node here is a person. We are going to replace it with a small community. How should this community look like? Well, like a chain. We want self-similarity. right? So we want a chain of chains uh, connected together. And the question is, uh, this, this is nice and self-similar. And the question is, how are we going to link the two, the, the three chains together? The straightforward way of saying, okay, let's link the middle guys together is not a good idea. Why not? Because it kills the diameter, right? The diameter was two here, right? The furthest possible number of steps is two. And here the diameter after just one iteration is one, two, three, four, right? So that's not a good idea. So what would be a good idea? It turns out that a good idea is this one, which makes no sense, un until we look at the uh, adjacency matrix. So the, the, the idea is to start with a 3 times 3 adjacency matrix, where everything is present, even self-loops, except a link from the very first uh, node to the very last node. right? And then what we can do is we can create a 9 times, uh, nine, times 9 matrix, where every as follows, for every cell, we are going to replace this cell with a small 3 times 3 matrix, which is G1 again, right? So this is a 3 times 3 matrix. This is a 3 times 3 matrix. This is a 3 times 3 matrix full of zeros, right? So we have a graph, well-defined graph, right? If we plot it, it looks like this one above. And this graph eventually has all the properties we want. Let's quickly look at the diameter. Any pair of nodes is two steps away, like the original one. So it's, uh, we won't go into a lot of details, but the idea is that we can continue doing that recursively. So we can have, so this is the adjacency matrix after four Kronecker exponentiation. So this is backtrack. This is called Kronecker matrix multiplication, right? And after four Kronecker matrix exponentiations like that, we have a graph, the adjacency matrix looks like that. And we can see the structure of the chain, right? So Community number one does not talk to community number three. And within that, within the very first community, the community number one one does not talk to community number one three, and so on recursively. So this looks very much like the Sierpinski triangle. We're drilling holes at every level, right? So we have these holes in the beginning, and then these holes later, and then these holes later, and so on and so forth, right? And, and the, the, the interesting conclusion is that with this relatively simple construct, it's one line of, of MATLAB, uh, we can have, we have all the properties we want. We can prove Kronecker, the Kronecker matrix, Kronecker matrix multiplication is a well-studied operation, and it has all the theorems. The degree distribution is multinomial. Without getting into details, this looks very much like a power law. The diameter is constant. That was the heaviest proof. That was a half a, half a page proof, that, but it's, it's true. Uh, this is known from the theory of Kronecker matrix multiplication. This is also true. So exactly because we started with self-similarity, we don't even have to try to prove these, these properties are all shown except for the diameter, which is also possible to prove. Right? So uh, these, for every snapshot of the matrix, these uh, properties hold. Uh, the growth power law uh, 
The shrinking diameter, we proved that the diameter is constant, right? Uh, not shrinking, not growing, but constant. And it turns out that we can very easily prove that the number of nodes versus number of edges follows a power law. So this is the first and uh, first and only generator for which we can prove these properties. Uh, let's skip this portion. So here is uh, the, um, the question is how, so we have a real graph, the autonomous systems or opinions, right? How can we find a good generator, a good initial G1 graph so that after enough matrix multiplications, we get something that has the properties of our original graph? It turns out that this is possible. Uh, Jure Leskovich uh, continued on this, along this line and figured out a way to, to find out the correct parameters of the initial G1 graph. The bottom line, uh, we're skipping a lot of details, the bottom line is that if we plot, let's say, the degree distribution, uh, degree here versus count on the vertical axis, uh, white is the real data set, black is the, uh, the best Kronecker matrix that we could find with, the, with these properties. Uh, this is the hop plot, this is number of uh, hops we do, and this is number of pairs that can reach each other within these plots. So this is the diameter, the diameter is four for both black and white, and so on and so forth. So this, this generator can mimic a lot of the properties of a real graph. Uh, so this is the conclusion. We can have, with a chronic matrix multiplication, we can uh, achieve a lot of the properties of the real graphs, and we can even mimic a, a real graph. Oops. Right. Sorry. So the next problem is, uh, how to find tools, uh, some tools so that they can help us answer interesting questions in real graphs. So one question is, who is the mastermind? Suppose we have, uh, let me, so this joint work with uh, Hang Hang Tong, also PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon. So the problem is defined as follows. We have a social network, let's say of scientists, who co-authored with what, and we have, uh, this is a famous uh, biologist, this is a famous uh, law professor, this is uh, the other one is a famous uh, chemist professor, we want to create a cross-disciplinary cross -disciplinary lab. And the question is, we want these three people in our lab, who would be the person who could talk to all three of them uh, so that the lab works harmoniously, right? So, uh, or in another setting, in law enforcement, we could say, well, this is a criminal, this is a criminal, this is a criminal, who is the, the most central uh, criminal, which is probably the mafia, the mafia <laughs> boss in this case, right? Uh, so, so and, and, and of course, this is, imagine a huge social network with millions of nodes, right? And we want to, we have a fixed budget, let's say, of uh, 20 nodes, so that we want to return the 20 most relevant nodes to the user, right? So, so what we would like is, given these three query nodes, we would like the system to bring, to bring this as the most central node with a score of how central it is with respect to the three uh, target uh, nodes, and then maybe additional more if we, if we, if we still have enough budget. Uh, the idea is to use random walk with three starts to measure the proximity. How close is this node to this node, right? We, have, we, we propose to use random walk with three starts. No need to go into a lot of details. Uh, let's see the algorithm at work. So here is the, the question. We want, uh, here are the four query nodes in the DBLP, Database and Logic Programming uh, Co-authorship Network. Uh, Rakesh Agrawal, one of the most well-known uh, data mining and uh, data mining, Jawei Han, also very well-known uh, in data mining, Michael Jordan from uh, Berkeley, uh, very well-known in machine learning, and Vapnik of uh, support vector machine uh, uh, theory, uh, also well-known in theory, right? So we want people who have good connections to all four of them, right? And if we run the algorithm, we see that we are uh, the name. The letters don't show very well. So here are the faces. So Heike Manila shows, shows up, uh, who is very cross-disciplinary, has papers in biology, has papers in, uh, with Nokia engineers. So he's a very cross-disciplinary person. Uh, Padraic Smith from UC Irvine is the person who is, uh, UC Irvine, I'm sure we, uh, uh, oh, several of us have used the data sets that are there. And uh, Daryl Prejbon is a statistician, but he has been working on large data sets called graphs, uh, who calls whom. And again, we see that they have uh, relatively weak connections, one paper joined together, one paper joined together, but these are the people that, ha that are uh, in the center when these four people are of interest, right? Uh, and there is a very interesting variation. So suppose 
backtrack. Here we want people who are connected to all four of them, right? What if we, what if we don't find anybody? What if the, the machine learning people are completely disassociated from the data mining people? Uh, which is not the case here. But uh, if it was, we would get no answer. So we relax the query and say, well, give us people who are connected to at least two of them, of the four gray nodes. So here is the answer. Now we see a different set of people. You cannot see the names. Uh, but now we see that the two groups are separated, right? Which sort of makes sense? Uh, machine learning, the more the, these people are in more theoretical versions of machine learning, while uh, the, the Jawai Han and Rakesh Agarwal are more practical data mining. So, so we see that there is a sort of a separation, which tells us that the two communities are a little bit uh, apart, much closer than other communities, of course, but sort of apart. So the conclusion is that uh, we can solve the, the centerpiece graph problem, and it turns out that we can estimate the, the answers we want very quickly, achieving huge speedups, 150 times speed up by using some um, complicated matrix algebra, and specifically the Sherman Morrison Lima. So that was uh, the mastermind problem. Uh, how, we, how can we track problem number four, how, five? How can we track communities over time? So this is joint work with uh, uh, Jim Eng Sang, who joined IBM. And uh, the problem is the following. We have a graph. We have, let's say, again, from DBLP, we have authors. Every row is an author. Every column is a keyword. And we have a dot or a count, uh, how many times the specific keyword was mentioned by a paper for, for this author, right? So we would expect to see a, a group of database people talking about database things, query optimization and partitioning and indexing and so on, uh, machine learning people talking about other things, and uh, so software engineering people talking about other things, and so on and so forth, right? So this was 1990. If we get another graph, on 91, this is another matrix. And 92, it's another matrix. So the whole, uh, how do we find patterns across time? It turns out that the official name for a collection of graphs is a tensor. And, and what we want is to do a three-way analysis. So singular value decomposition will do a two-way analysis and say these authors are related to these uh, keywords and for that year, right? We would like to have a three-way decomposition, something like something like this one, which will say uh, every, every column here corresponds to a keyword. Every row corresponds to a hidden variable that will try to reverse engineer eventually, right? Uh, this, the, the, the matrix U author, uh, again, has uh, concepts, and also every row, every row corresponds to an author. And uh, this, uh, this is called the core tensor. The core tensor will tell us how the communities evolve over time. So if we look at this specific vector, we'll see that, let's say, the blue concept uh, contains, uh, has high score with respect to the keyword pattern. The red concept has a high score with respect to the keyword query. And if we look up, let's say, these keywords, the, the author matrix, we'll see that, let's say, Philip Yu has high score with respect to the blue con concept and Michelson Baker with, uh, with respect to the red concept. So we could probably guess that the red, red concept is uh, database engine people, query optimization and indexing and so on. And the blue concept is data mining people, association rules, and, uh, and related work. So let's see how this uh, works. This was a schematic. Let's see the real data. Uh, this is a description of the data set, DBLP, for, for VLDB and KDD conferences. And we see that if we do the analysis in 1995, we see that uh, the most prominent vector con has high scores for authors like uh, Stonebreaker, Michael Carey, uh, H.V. Jagadish, and so on. And the most prominent keywords are object-oriented, 95 object-oriented, object-relational, called hot topics, uh, uh, optimization, concurrency control, and so on. In 2004, which is later, we see that, uh, again, there are now there are two vectors. The first author vector has, again, uh, Stonebreaker, Michael Stonebreaker, and so on. But the keywords have changed. Now we're talking about storage, views, service, uh, cache, and so on. And there's a second vector. So this is probably the database concept. And this is the second vector, Jawai Han, Philip Yu, uh, and others talking about streams, patterns, uh, clustering, uh, clustering, uh, querying, and so on. Right? So this is probably the data mining cluster. And this was done completely automatically. We just specified, say, find two hidden variables, and this is what the algorithm came up with. We didn't instruct it to do any clustering, any k-means, or anything else. Uh, the, the second application of uh, the tensor viewpoint is 
uh, traffic matrices. So we collect the data uh, from, from uh, an ISP. Uh, and here are the IP source number, and here is the IP destination number. A dot means that at this point of time, and we have one matrix for every hour, right? This means, a, a blue dot means that at this point of time, whoops, sorry. At this point of time, this IP source sent at least one packet to this destination, right? So if we try, uh, we won't go through the details of the algorithm, but uh, this was joint work with networking colleagues, Hui Zhang from uh, 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 from, from CMU and uh, Yingliang Z. Uh, so if we, uh, if we try to compress successive matrices, we can figure out when the compression fails or when the compression requires too much work, in which case we declare an anomaly. And this was the case where, uh, this was a case where compression was easy with respect to the previous windows, the previous time ticks. Uh, while this was uh, created the uh, compression problems. And we verified it with system administration. They say, yes, there is a lot of port scanning activity here. So this, is, this IP is doing a port scanning. This is also doing a port scanning. Uh, port scanning by itself is not bad. We're all doing it just to make sure we have no vulnerabilities, right? But there were too much port scanning at this time tick. And that was verified by, by human operators, right? So the conclusions are that uh, tensor-based methods envisioning uh, a collection of matrices as a tensor and uh, operating on them with uh, tensor decomposition can help us find patterns, can help us do compression. Right? So we covered the, f uh, the original five problems. There is some, since there is more time, let me talk about uh, two more topics, virus propagation and how to find uh, fraud detection uh, at eBay. So the virus propagation, the problem is the following. We have a social network or a computer network. We want to figure out how how viruses or rumors or blog influence propagates. And, and we are mainly interested in the so-called epidemic threshold. Uh, if we have something like a flu virus, will it linger for a long time or will it, will, or will it get uh, wiped out after a few time ticks? So let's uh, start with a few definitions. So there are two major models in, uh, in virus propagation. Uh, and several secondary ones. The most, uh, the, the most difficult to analyze is the so-called SIS model, which is like the flu, right? The flu says we are healthy, then we become infected and, uh, uh, and infect others around us, everybody in our neighborhood, uh, and then we become healthy again and the cycle repeats, right? So the, the, the properties that we have how, uh, is what is the probability of attack when I'm sick? What are the chances that my neighbors will get infected, right? and also the probability that I'll get well. Once I'm sick, what are the chances that I'll get well in the next time tick? This is discrete event simulation, right? So clearly what matters is the ratio of how many people I will attack until one over delta is actually the average time until, until I recover, right? So how many people will, will I be able to attack until I get well? So this is the strength of the virus. And now the question is, if somebody gives us a graph, what can we say about the virus? We know the beta and delta. We know how strong is the virus, how many people everybody will infect until it heals, until this person heals. Uh, will, will the virus survive in a graph like that? Well, obviously not. These are four monks who have vowed in silence. And the question is, will the rumor propagate? No, it won't, because the monk who knows the rumor eventually will forget, right, with probability delta. So the rumor will wipe out after exponential time, right? Uh, will the rumor propagate, uh, survive here? We don't know. It depends how how infectious is the rumor or the flu, right? Uh, will it survive here? Um, we don't know, but probably it has better chances here because this looks like a kindergarten situation. People with children probably know that you send your children to school, they get all the germs, and then they become, they get the flu, and they give the flu to everybody else, right? So this is a very good, right? This is a very good graph for, for the virus. Notice that with, they all have four nodes. The last two have three edges, but this is better for the virus, right? So, so what does the the epidemic threshold depends on. Probably depends on the average degree, right? The more friends you have, the better for the virus. The more handshakes you do while we, are f we have the flu, the better for the virus, right? It will also depend on the highest degree. If there is something like a kindergarten setting here, then the virus is happy, right? So would it also depend on the variance? Maybe. Would it depend on other moments? So, so how many numbers? Would it depend on the diameter? Maybe. So how many numbers? are involved in estimating the epidemic threshold. It turns out that only one is enough, the first eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. So 
the, this is the theorem. Uh, the proof is by Cheng Xi Wang and colleagues in SRDS 2003. So this is the strength of the virus. So if the strength of the virus is less than t, where t is the one over the eigenvalue, then the virus will be wiped out very quickly, right? It's like the rumor in the monks situation, right? Above that, it will stay on for a long time. So here is simulation results on a real network. This is from Oregon, autonomous systems again. So we started infecting all the nodes at time t equals zero. And then we see what happens when we, very, uh, we plot the number of infected people, infected nodes after 200, 250 time ticks, 500 time ticks, and so on and so forth. And we see what happens when we vary the, the strength of the virus, the beta over delta. So when we are above threshold, we see that the population of infected people oscillates. It's not even the same people, but the total number of infected people uh, more or less remains the same with uh, some small oscillations, right? If we are below threshold, then very quickly everybody heals, right? If we are at threshold, then the, the, it stays for a long time. So this verifies the, the derivations, the assumptions that we did to derive the theorem before. Uh, now the last is how do we spot fraud in eBay, right? So here is the, this is joint work with uh, Paul Chao and uh, Sasang Vandit at CMU. So here is the situation. Uh, uh, at eBay, the people, uh, can, we can represent them as nodes. And when two people uh, uh, buy and sell something, then they give feedback to each other. Let's assume that all the blue edges are positive feedbacks. Right? If it's negative, then we know it's fraud, right? We don't touch this person. So suppose that all these people have positive feedbacks. And the question is, this person is advertising a three, an expensive piece of equipment that we want to buy, a $3,000 uh, LCD screen, right? Huge LCD screen. Would we buy from this person? Yes or no? He sort of looks uh, a lot of positive feedbacks, right? So this looks good, right? Would we buy from this person? Mm, this looks only to feedbacks, right? Uh, debatable. So what should we do? It turns out that uh, there are a lot of fraud types, of course. So when there's money, there's fraud, right? Uh, but uh, this specific case, this is a, an ingenious type of fraud. So what happens is that the red dots are fraudsters. The yellow dots are uh, semi-fraudsters. There are accomplices, right? And the green dots are honest. So what happens is that the accomplices stay for a long time. They occasionally sell some uh, cheap items to honest people, so they get they establish good credibility, right? They never do anything bad. They never defraud people, and their only purpose in life is to give good feedback to bad to the red people. So this person logs in as let's say Smith one two three, uh, automatically gets good feedback from the yellow nodes, which are probably himself or herself logging in different, uh, under different name, right? gets good feedback, so the green node will say, well, this guy has a lot of positive feedback. So probably he's honest, right? After a week, defrauds uh, two or three people, and then, and then uh, eBay uh, shut down. The, there are so many negative feedbacks that the account is shut down. No problem. Smith123 disappears, and then Smith124 appears here. The whole thing repeats again, so the infrastructure is ready to give good feedback to bad fraudsters. So it turns out that if we uh, are we able to can we detect these patterns? It turns out that with belief propagation, we can spot this bipartite course. And we can, this is the uh, output of, uh, of, of our net probe system, which will give scores, three scores for every node. How, how fraudulent this node looks like, how accomplished like it looks like, and how honest it looks like. So, so this is the output of the program. And it turns out that it can spot bipartite cores uh, very easily even if some edges are missing. We did some sensitivity analysis and edges, and even with missing edges, we can spot uh, bipartite cores. So the conclusion is that uh, graphs pose fascinating problems. Uh, uh, Self-similarity and power laws uh, help us find patterns when other methods don't work. Uh, we presented some new surprising patterns like the shrinking diameter. The Kronecker generator is, uh, has very nice properties and can, uh, can be very easily programmed, and we can prove about uh, uh, theorems about it. Uh, the pro very promising directions uh, is to uh, reach out to other communities like sociology, epidemiology, and so on. Even uh, also uh, diverse communities like computer networks with IP addresses and IP traffic, uh, uh, intrusion detection, and so on. In numerical analysis, we mentioned about tensor tools. There are very interesting 
systems issues. How do you store a large tensor? Yeah, even if it's sparse, eventually we have to be very careful how we manipulate the tensors so that they fit in memory or that they don't require too many disk accesses. This is a, a reminder of how a tensor looks like. And uh, here is uh, the, we mentioned that one promising area is to help with computer networks or storage systems and monitoring. So here is uh, one project that we're doing with the PDL Parallel Data Lab at CMU. So the, our, our electrical engineering colleagues want to build a data center with uh, 100 more nodes. Eventually the goal is to have a peta, petabyte scale data center. So it's uh, a little bit smaller than this room, right? So one quarter of it is already full. We have 100 nodes there. And the, the goal is to monitor these uh, 100 nodes to figure out whether there, there are problems with them. So one of them might have overheated CPU, the other might have uh, a disk that is failing. So we want to keep track of all these measurements and automatically figure out whether something is going wrong so that we can notify the human operator. And so their goal is to have a system which will be uh, self-correcting, self-securing, self-star, self self-everything, right? And this creates a wonderful opportunity because, uh, because we can uh, this system can help us in both ways, right? or data centers like that can help us in both ways. We can, we can use them to analyze large data sets that don't fit in, that uh, span petabytes. Uh, and also we can use it, uh, we can offer, uh, offer back uh, machine learning and data mining algorithms which will spot anomalies and help them uh, manage the system more efficiently. So this is the end of the presentation. These are citations that we mentioned before. And uh, these are my coordinates. I'd be happy to discuss things uh, offline or through email. Thank you. Jennifer, yes. So the question is, what are the, the biggest challenges, uh, biggest research challenges when we are mining graphs? Uh, I think everything we mentioned before, also extending graphs so that uh, they can handle attributes as you have been working on, right? So mm, almost all of these graphs we saw here have no attributes. Every node is a node, that's it, right? Uh, what happens if the node has attributes, like uh, it's a human with age, uh, years in school, uh, I don't know, something, some other attributes, right? How can we find patterns in this case? Do people with similar education cluster together or do they uh, repel each other or what, right? So that's one. The other is what happens when the edges are of different type. So far, all the edges are, have one meaning, right? Either I trust you or, or, or that edge doesn't exist. What happens if we have communication networks? So one edge is whether I call you. The other edge is whether I email you. The other edge is whether I send an instant message to you. And then we want to figure out whether maybe a lot of email communication means that we have very little instant messaging communication or, or the other way around, right? So we don't know about that. And of course, uh, the temporal evolution, right? So all, all this, the cross product of nodes with attributes, cross product nodes with uh, edges with attributes and all that evolving over time. I think this is a challenge that will keep us busy for several, <laughs> at least a decade. Good question, thanks. Well, it. Very good question. Uh, but uh, the, if I focus only on the original set of nodes, does their diameter shrink, like they uh, drop connections, drop edges? Or? Uh, very good point. So, so uh, we can speculate because we don't have, uh, there's not a well-formed uh, theory. Uh, what what we what uh, I suspect it happens, and it could be wrong, but it's good explanation, is that uh, newcomers uh, usually have more or less the same number of citations. So, so we have the patents citing other patents, right? The, the, the typical number of citations does not change. But what happens is once in a while there is a patent who for some crazy reason has 1,000 other citations. It messes up the average without actually changing the behavior, right? And, 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 and by the same token, we have a, a paper citing each other. Once in a while, there is a survey with 150 citations. So this shrinks the diameter. So the more we wait, the bigger chances 
there will be that will have a survey and a super survey and a super, super, super survey. Uh, human behavior is strange, right? We won't be surprised to see a survey with a thousand citations, right? You, you saw the, this uh, opinions.com guy who, who had 2,000 two uh, people that uh, he or she trusts, right? So maybe this is an explanation. The more we wait, the more crazy, <laughs> the more over, overworked people will, will see, which will bring the diameter to short values. And I should clarify that uh, uh, we ignore the directionality for all these cases to compute the diameter. Good question, too. Yeah. Yes, Sanjay? Mm -hmm. So, why would that assumption you have centralized knowledge of uh, all data sets? Uh, Correct. Because I think it's not just a fact that there are faster knowledge centers. There's a whole stream of knowledge centers. So, it's not just one data set. It's a peer to peer access of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Let me repeat it. So, so this algorithm runs on the full uh, uh, da data set that we download, 60,000 people with uh, almost 1 million edges, right? So Sanjay very correctly asks, so, so what happens if we are interested on only on this person, whether this person is honest or not, and we instead of downloading 60,000 people or 40 million people that eBay has, uh, we only uh, focus on uh, the two or three steps away. Well, three steps away is almost everybody, right? But uh, anyway, we, 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 sh uh, we focus on a small subset. Will the algorithm still work? Uh, that, that's exactly what we're working on. Excellent question. We're, we're working exactly on that to figure out the sensitivity. If we, if we have somehow a sample of uh, 10 or 20 nodes in the vicinity, whatever we define the vicinity, uh, do we get a good estimate for the honesty of this person? Now, if we make it 200 nodes, 300 nodes, uh, I, I don't have an answer. Hopefully, we'll have an answer before the deadline for dub dub dub, right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. So are there any other fraud patterns we can detect? We, not automatically. Not automatically. We have to, he, here we had to sit down and think. Uh, actually, uh, Polo said that I noticed that there are these type of uh, guys which are there forever and doing nothing except giving consistently good feedback to consistently bad guys, right? Uh, so, so then we built a, a we created a, a belief propagation matter which says we have three types of nodes, honest, uh, the fraud, and accomplice. And what can we tell? If, if I tell you I'm accomplished, what can you tell about my neighbors? Well, either they're fraud or honest, right? Because I didn't specify that uh, accomplices never talk to each other. Fraudsters never talk to each other. Why waste time to log in and all that, right? Uh, so so, so if, 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 if there is a different type of fraud, which will involve four roles, uh, honest accomplices and I don't know what, uh, decoys or whatever <laughs> the fraud scheme is, then we have to sit down and think and create the Belief propagation, the belief, the four by four or whatever is x by x matrix from scratch. And you're right, ideally would like to have a, a big network with a few labeled nodes saying this is, this, this type of fraud is called non-delivery fraud, right? So here is a case of non-delivery fraud. Here is a case of um, the Sanjay type of uh, whatever you want to mention, right? Uh, and, and, and then ideally would like this system to learn the types of fraud and learn automatically the, the belief propagation matters. I think that's too ambitious, but yeah, that would be the holy grail, yeah. Yes? Ah, very good question. So uh, the evaluation is very hard. So the question is how often do we get uh, false positives and false negatives and things like that? So uh, the evaluation is very hard. So what we did, we had, uh, we spotted uh, a, a, a number of people. The, the, we spot a number of people which, uh, judging from their behavior, they, they should be bad. And then the algorithm spotted all of them, the, the algorithm labeled them as, as fraud. Did we miss others? Maybe. Did we? <laughs> right. So, so, so we, that, that's a very good question. For the small evaluation experiments we did, 
it, beha it behaves very well. Ah, also good question. So, so, so if we know that this person is, let's say, uh, uh, the gender. Suppose we know the gender. Suppose we know the age. Suppose we know. Actually, we know the history of this person, right? The sales history of this person. Does this person sell high-priced things on Sunday morning? Two thousand of these things, or not? Which is all right. So, so we had the history. We try to express the history in a few numbers, and then include that in the belief propagation. It turned out that it didn't make a difference. Just the structure was a very strong indicator, so we, we ignored the, the sales history. Probably the, 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 the background maybe would make a difference. To our surprise, right? We would expect the history to help. And that gets back to your, your attributes. Mm. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Another, oh, I'd like to thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much.